But we don't see that in a uh, as tangibly in the quadrivium. And as a result, what we need to do is remind ourselves that the study of science and the study of, of arithmetic has a formative role to play um, in students. Hello, my name is Shane Saxon. I'm here with my guest, Mitchell Holly, And we are finishing a series that we have been doing on the liberal arts. We've talked about the trivium, the quadrivium, and, and that idea that we've come back to over and over again that the liberal arts are a bedrock of curriculum, that when everything else is changing, everything else is shifting, these are principles, these are skills that if we can equip our students with them, then they have the tools, they have the, the organon, as it were, uh, right. of knowledge. They can acquire knowledge if they have been equipped. And it's been, it's been a fun ride. Yeah, and we've tried to place that in a context mm -hmm. of, of education. You know, we've tried to say that an, a true education should consist both of the sciences and the arts. Right. And um, in, a, in a perfect world, you'd be educated in all the arts, right? Both the manual <laughs> arts, the fine arts, right. and the liberal arts. Um, but the liberal, liberal arts have a unique role to play mm. um, because they are exercises that we do on ourselves. So we're right. training of the mind to prepare us for a lifetime of learning to think well. Yeah, so if you have not listened to this series, this is the final episode. Go back, listen to our first episode where we introduce the liberal arts, and then we go episode by episode through the trivium, grammar, logic, rhetoric, and then now we've spent two episodes on the quadrivium. In the last episode, we talked about arithmetic and music, and today we're going to talk a little bit about geometry and astronomy. And I... I don't know how familiar you are with uh, Zeno's paradox, but it's something that's always kind of intrigued me. And I, I know that there, what we're talking about today has been some of the answer to the paradox, but Zeno's paradox is this. If you had to walk across the street to get milk at the grocery store, you have to go from point A to point C. To point or, M, milk. To point M. To get there, you have to cross the middle point, point B. However, in order for you to actually get across, you also have to cross the middle point between point A and point B. And so to cross that, you also have to cross the middle point between point A and point B in half to half of point A to point B. In fact, mathematically speaking, in order for you to get milk, you have to cross an infinite regress of half points. And so theoretically speaking, it's not actually mathematically possible for you to cross the street to get milk. And, and that's Zerino's paradox. He, he also talks about the paradox of a bow and arrow, that if you are trying to articulate the position of a bow and arrow, when it is fully pulled back, it's in one position. But when you shoot it, it moves. However, at each point, its velocity is zero because it's at that point. Mm -hmm. So how does it move if at every point on its trajectory, it's at zero. And this is a philosophical point that provides the, the foundational underpinning for any time, you know, your wife asks you to go to the grocery store. Right. You know, hey, can you pick up diapers on your way home? No, can't. Literally, it's impossible. Literally it's impossible. Physically, it, <laughs> philosophically impossible. Um, you know, you know, <laughs> Zeno helped us with this. Right. Mitch, why are you moving so slowly? Well, it's because mathematically speaking, I'm at my velocity is at zero when I'm in a given particular point. That's exactly right. right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, at at the end of the day, the the Greeks actually played a you know just to come back full all the way around. You know, the Greeks did a great job of setting the foundation for um, for arithmetic, but also for geometry. As yeah. Well. So so again, th those illustrations just kind of set up the problem. What we are talking about today speaks to how we solve those kinds of paradoxes. At least there's metaphysical ways to solve them, but then there are also ways to better quantify those kinds of things, motion and, and movement. So bringing it back all the way around, today we're talking about the other two arts of the quadrivium. Last mm -hmm. time it was arithmetic and uh, music. Today we're talking about geometry and astronomy. So what are they? Help me to understand them in their classical sense, and then we can <clears throat> go from there. Yeah, so it, it is helpful to make the distinction that in arithmetic, you're studying and, and you're developing the skill of manipulating discrete numbers or just discrete quantities. 
Uh, and then music is the application of that in the natural world. Whereas with geometry, you're studying continuous numbers or continuous quantities. And then astronomy is the application of that in, in the modern world. And so when you look at back at history, uh, Euclid is obviously the name, the Greek name that comes to mind, who kind of gathered together a lot of these theorems and postulates um, from the early uh, Greek mathematicians um, and, and then tried to teach them in a systematic way. Um, but then, you know, after the after the Enlightenment, you have Rene Descartes is coming mm -hmm. in and it's trying to reorient the study of, of geometry a mm -hmm. bit. Um, and so, you know, both modern geometry and Euclidean geometry have their purpose, have their place, but um, they are a little, you know, but they're operating off the, the same basic principle. We're talking about, we're trying to quantify continuous numbers. Right. We're trying to manipulate those. And it's, we, we can acquire that skill through um, the study of geometry. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Yeah. You know, I think that a lot of times my students, when they're reading Shakespeare, he has lines about you know the harmony of of the of the stars and the planets and there's this entire kind of astronomical vocabulary that's mm -hmm. being employed that they don't have any reference for mm -hmm. and it's because astronomy's played such a large role in the curriculum in the middle ages and in, in ancient greece because that's where they were practicing their advanced math in a that's sense that's right they had, you know they looked up and they saw heavenly bodies moving they mm -hmm. saw things in motion and so they had to you know find a way to quantify these things and then we have you know the birth of geometry and that's another important in point is that a lot of people think that everyone thought the earth was flat into, <laughs> yeah. you know well into um, the modern ages but the reality is that that's not true most intelligent educated people did not think that the earth was flat and it's because they were doing highly advanced math in regards to the skies and, and to really do accurate math, they had to have a sense of the geometry of the physical space that they possessed. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's exactly right. And, and, you know, as again, the quad and going back to what the quadrivium is, it is a skills of the self. Um, right. But in the quadrivium, unlike the trivium, we're stepping a little bit outside of us to be able to quantify and look at and, and really be able to quantify the beauty of the natural world. So how does uh, geometry and astronomy pop up in the curriculum? I mean, we don't really study astronomy in this way um, today. Right. That's exactly – in our curriculum, we do geometry uh, – sorry, we do um, astronomy in fourth grade. And so we're not studying astronomy in the same way that the ancients did. Now, that doesn't mean we're disconnected from the classical tradition. I can get, yeah, we can talk about that in just a second. But just in terms of where it pops up. Uh, we're studying, when we study astronomy in, in fourth grade, we're not really studying the movements of bodies in the, in, in the sky. Right, we're not right. really studying astronomy in the same sort of um, geometric way. We're mainly looking at the stories um, that are kind of embodied in those, uh, right. those myths that are kind of embodied in those, uh, those heavenly bodies, right? So um, <clears throat> where this kind of pops up for us in the curriculum is because geometry is 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 really a secondary skill you first have to learn arithmetic right um, so geometry just pops up later you know you're looking at high, the high school years um, and as a result when we turn and look at nature well let me stop and just say that the reason why we come to it later is because it's absolutely crucial that you master uh, arithmetic right and then when it does pop up and we start studying geometry in, in the in the early, early middle high school years. Um, that is kind of tied with, you know, um, uh, calculus and mm -hmm. and physics, um, and and that for us is um, a sort of the the turning to the natural world, taking geometry, taking the study of continuous numbers, and then turning to the natural world and try to analyze that the study of motion right that's right. what calculus is and so we're trying to look at things in motion and we're trying to analyze that using uh geometric thinking yeah a lot of these the principles in the culture have, have come together in various subdisciplines in a way that are, are really helpful study physics study calculus study um algebra all they're all applications in the mm -hmm. in the natural world in various ways of discrete number and continuous number. So it looks a little bit different, but it's the same exercise. And that way, in the fourth grade, when we're studying astronomy, we're not um, overloading these students with you know arcane 
details that are difficult for them, we are trying to ground them in a cultural tradition of stories. Right. Um, it's not like my buddy who's you know getting his master's d- degree to be a a, po- uh, a boat captain and he had to learn astral navigation. Like yeah. that that that's something totally different right. than what we're teaching in the fourth grade. Right. That's exactly and and, and we're. We're using the study of astronomy uh, in those early years to just – it just plays a different function, right? Mm-hmm. Students haven't mm-hmm. even had geometry yet. They're still working on their arithmetic. Right. Um, so it will be important for us in the classical tradition to articulate and try to reestablish uh, algebra in some ways, but also, um, you know, calculus and physics as legitimate um, kind of turns to nature, so we're taking those the discrete skills of, of arithmetic and we're taking the the continuous skills of geometry and then we're turning to nature and um, but for us that looks like in some ways algebra and in some ways calculus and physics. Yeah, so that's a helpful point because it has application <clears throat> to the ways that we've incorporated natural philosophy into our curriculum, what we used to be called natural philosophy that's now mostly called science. That is, th- this is word science used equivocally as you mentioned on our, our way back in our intro episode, just refers to bodies of knowledge. Mm-hmm. But this application of in quadrivium of um, discrete number and continuous number actually is is what now what we call science. And mm-hmm. so there are <clears throat> principles in the way that we teach science in the Memorial Press Online Academy and at uh, in the Memorial Press curriculum. Can you talk a little bit about that and the way that we teach what used to be called natural philosophy that's now science, and how does it relate to the quadrivium? Yeah, so, well, so first of all, the, the trivium culminates in the moral sciences, mm. the more, you know, literature, philosophy, history. Um, the quadrivium kind of culminates in the natural sciences. Um, and, and, and so they're the skills kind of required, the dispositions even, um, that will make us good students of nature. Mm. That they'll, they'll help us see things, quantify things, um, discover things right. that, that we didn't see before. Um, but that, but what that really means is that if we're going to be successful scientists uh, in a modern sense, um, then we have to continue our development at a very mm. early age on the the trivium, the quadrivium. Yeah. Um, it, so yes, there is a, a movement outwards that the liberal arts kind of have, they start here in the person in the, in the agent in the knower, and then they work their way out. Um, but they fun, but they have to start here. Right. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's why they have their role to play in the context of an entire education. You know, if you're looking at 12th through 12th grade or sorry, kindergarten through 12th grade, um, you know, it's important that we don't start off kindergartners studying, you know, um, chemistry. <laughs> right, <laughs> and, right. uh, not just because they they would struggle to understand it, but because they have not acquired the necessary skills. Mm. Um, and, and so having a clear order to when we introduce science, mm. how we introduce science. You know, so in the early years, before students have acquired the geometric thinking, then um, really up until... Um, you know, through middle school, we're looking at science as a, uh, a, a someone interacting with the world. So studying mm. trees, studying yeah. insects, mammals, and we're not quite getting into thinking geometrically mm. about those things. Um, and that's because that's a skill that develop that's that's a, it's a later skill right now. Right. right in those early ages, they might be able to count lions, but they might not, they might not be able to think geometrically about. Uh, the growth, the growth rings on trees, or right, you know right. those, or, or you know how stars move, um, or you know th- things like that. Yeah. So eventually, it's going to culminate in that, right? Uh, where it's going to culminate in the study of motion, and we're going to be able to look at the natural world and hopefully apply geometric thinking to that. But we're still, we we, we want to make sure that that is coming at the right time um, in their natural sciences, in the natural sciences. So a question I've been wanting to ask you about the quadrivium, um, and I, I want to get your thoughts on this, are I think a lot of uh, people in classical education are kind of skeptical of, of science in, in a way. There's a, a lot of criticism directed towards STEM-focused educational programs, and yet I see a lot of life-giving potential to applying arithmetic and geometry in the natural world, the ways that we study the natural world. So I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. 
Yeah, it's unfortunate, I think, that in most of our articulations of classical education that we've reduced it basically to the trivium. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's because in order to have you know, rigorous thinking about how the quadrivium will play a role in classical education and what it really does for you, um, that requires yourself training in these things. Mm. And, you know, I think some, we look back at our educations, um, you know, as, as, you know, parents and, and, uh, you know, administrators at schools or whatever. And we say, you know, maybe there was something that I was missing as well. And so we're kind of coming to these a little bit later and it's kind of low hanging fruit really to say that the trivium is a pure focus because, because of that sort of agent focus, um, that, you know, you yourself, uh, are growing, but we don't see that in a, uh, as tangibly in the quadrivium. And as a result, what we need to do is remind ourselves that the study of science and the study of, of arithmetic has a formative role to play mm. um, in students. Right. You know, you think about the intellectual virtues of that are required to sit down every single day and do your homework, mm -hmm. to memorize your math facts, yeah. and the sort of, um, the sort of um, intellectual virtues of, uh, of wisdom and discernment that comes, you know how the world functions, you mm. know how, how the, the bodies of, uh, move in the heavens and you know right. how the seasons uh, are, are brought because of the turning of the earth, right? right, and right. So you're able, to, you're able to see the world around you and then act with wisdom in relationship to it. And that's where, you know, I think that's really where the payoff it, it becomes for the quadrivium. It's yes, they're skills that you learn, but then when you then apply that to the sciences, you're able to see the beauty, the wonder, the magic that exists in the world that you would have never been able to mm -hmm. see had you not had a firm grounding in the quadrivium. Yeah, it's well said. It, it really, all of education is about cultivating wonder and affection in our hearts for the things that, that God has made. And, and no better is that seen than in the quadrivium. We are applying these principles in the natural world and seeing the way that God has ordered the universe um, and created the ability for, for things to move and to live. Yeah. This has been a great series. I've really enjoyed talking about the liberal arts with you, Mitch, and I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks.